Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking. This is the third section in our chapter on saws. And in it, we're going to build a pegged finger joint box. A type of joiner you, you can use all over the place. But in this specific example, we're going to be making a resonator box for the keys we made in the second section. Which, if you remember, was all about sawing accuracy. Different techniques so that you could take a line, leave a line, or even split a line as fine as a knife line. And while in that section we did mainly focus on the back saw, the techniques you learned in that section you could use for all different kinds of saws. Now if you remember in the first section we talked about the design of those saws. How the saw is the smartest tool we have in our woodworking arsenal. All we got to do is get out of its way because it wants to saw a straight accurate line. Now this little exercise is going to allow us to explore those tools plus a few of the other ones, the funky ones, such as the flush cutting saws or the turning saws like this coping saw because they use slightly different techniques to get the results you want. And the exercise is going to use a big box store lumber. Nothing special out here and because it's going to be pegged we are going to use a dowel and some drilling tools. The main clamping tool we're going to be using though is one of my mocks and vices. Now this is nothing spectacular. This one right here is just made out of construction lumber. But if you don't have a means to make threaded screws and stuff like that, you can just use those blue quick quick clamp vices. Because all this is is a free floating board here clamped to one another board that's clamped to a table. So with two boards and a couple of vices uh, clamps, you can make this and use a picnic table or if your wife or mom will let you, your kitchen table. Just don't get caught. Now for those of y'all curious, the fourth section is all going to be all about saw maintenance and modifications and from there we're going to go to a whole new chapter that focuses just on hand planes. So come along and let's make a pegged finger joint box. Now one of the first steps you're going to do in just about any project you're going to start is to begin roughing out the boards. And this is the realm of the rough cutting tools, the panel saws and stuff like that. And I'm one of those persons that because it's a rough cutting tool, I will cut my initial cuts a little bit oversized and get the finer cuts at my workbench with a back saw using those techniques we discussed in section two. Now the first thing I'm going to do is cut an inch off the end. Because this has been batting around my workshop, there's probably gravel, rocks, metal shavings, all that kind of stuff on the end. So just cut a little bit off the end. Plus the fact that cracks start from the end of a board, so there might be some internal cracks that we don't know about. So it's just best to get rid of it. Not the straightest cut in the world, but it'll get the job done. And remember, I'm going to refine this at the workbench. Some people will use a shooting board at this point, but I'll make a better cut. Now, pretty much all the woodworkers you see that really think things through, they take grain direction, grain orientation into the utmost importance. I want to wrap as much of the grain around the box as possible so that people pick it up, it can go all the way around. Now, I can't, in this situation, I can't wrap it all the way around because I, I don't want to split this board in half. But what I can do is wrap around three of the four sides and get the four sides pretty close. To do that one, that means I need to take, in a three by four box, I need to take a long board, short board, long board, short board, so that they can wrap. Which means I get, need to get my rough measurements now. Now I'm going to do a, a dimension 3x4 box, which means 16 inches for the long side, 12 inches for the short, short side. You do whatever you want. And it comes down to, I'm going to measure over 17 inches. Remember, I'm leaving a little, about an inch extra just so I can refine it at the workbench. And if the square isn't perfect, it doesn't really matter at this point in time. Starting at the toe, 
quick nibbles to get it started. And then I'm just taking the entire line because once again, this is a rough cut. And remember, pressure doesn't matter just as long as you maintain your speed, use a whole saw, it will cut fairly quickly. So, rough out the rest of them, and then head to the bench and we'll refine them. Well, as you can see, we got nice grain match in here. So at this point in time, I just like to go through and mark all my boards so that I know that they will go back together the same way. But I also want you to notice how rough those panel saws are. This is just butchered. It is fairly plumb and all that kind of stuff, but it is not a clean cut. So that's why I go an inch over when I'm roughing stuff out so I can refine it at the workbench with either a different saw or a hand plane. Now, in refining our cuts, this gives us ample opportunity to practice what we did in the second section in working our sawing technique. And because we're sawing across a longer board, it really gives us a good workout on skill development. Now, this might be the first time I've used a combination square in this video series, so I want to show you a few things. I put my knife in that nick, I bring my saw up to that knife line, but notice I'm keeping fingers behind the saw here and my thumb squeezing it in. That'll keep it all in line and it'll prevent the saw from moving back a little bit in case I press too hard with my knife. Because my knife is a wedge and that wedge actually wants to equalize pressures on both sides so it wants to go in a diagonal. That is another reason why that first slice is so light. It's just severing fibers because it kind of establishes a path for it to work down. So go down a few times. Also notice I am not marking the underside of the backside. Because we learned in the second section I can't see those to begin with. And this is just initial shaping. But it doesn't really matter. So this will give me plums. So I'll just work from those two. So, so I'm going to mark the rest of them. And I'll come right back to you. Okay, now that those two are marked out, let's return to our bench hooks. The staple of any joiner on, at the workbench. They are just so functional, makes life a lot easier. Now, for consistency purposes for this entire video, all the only back saw I'm going to use, even for my rib cuts, is the same saw I used in section two. It is a carcass saw filed cross cut. I'm just going to do this one to prove to you that you don't need a huge variety of saws in order to do this type of kind of work. And the main go-to saw I have is a carcass saw. So, I've got my uh, knife line there. I'm going to use the same techniques I used the other day on the smaller boards. Use my finger to set the initial setting. Nibble to get it started. And then just keep the saw moving. Working my finger back to align it to the blade. And as long as the tip stays in that one point, it should be very easy to steer. Now, I want you to notice I did start out using j just the tip of the tooth, but once I get going, I am going to establish a very long stroke because you can tell when I nibble, the saw binds up. What happens is sawdust gets in these teeth and you need to give it a chance to fall out. So the long saw stroke not only allows you to use all the saw blade, but it gives the saw ample time to release the sawdust so the, so the next stroke the saw can actually do its work. So I come down to the face on this side, and then it's just a matter of straightening the saw out to finish the cut. And it should be very plumb and straight. Now, if it isn't plumb and straight at this point in time, don't worry about it. The joinery technique we're going to be using will allow a little bit of variation, and the final process of squaring the entire box up will make it plumb and straight. Notice, notice how nice a finish it has compared to that rough coarse cut. You do still have a little bit of spelching, but it's nowhere near as bad. Something we can easily uh, finish up at the final stages with a little sandpaper or a block plank.
So once again, start it out, nibble your way across the top, get that kerf established, just so you don't have to focus on that top line. Once that kerf is established, focus on coming down this face side where the other line is, keeping it in that soft kerf, and that's where you just tighten your grip, start taking long strokes. Give it ample time to drop that sawdust down. When you hit the bottom of your baseline on this side, just keep it in the stroke, and it will want to go straight down. There we go. Do the rest of them, then we'll come back. With the last of these boards to mention, let's start doing some joinery. Now, I am going to be laying mine now so it's somewhat even, but this isn't critical at all at this point in time. I just like the way having even joints look. So you don't have to do this next step if you don't want to. I just do think it will make it look a little bit easier. Now, once you got it in the vise, it's nice to get it squared up so that you can use the weight of the back of your back saw to keep your cuts going straight down plumb. And I said I was going to lay mine out. I want to have five fingers on this joint. Two on the outside, one in the middle, and then one intersecting. Because these boards are going to basically link together like that. And we'll drop pegs in different ways to lock them all together. But to do that one and get them even, you can either use your eyeball or I like to use a set of dividers. So I've got my dividers if I want to set it out. Basically, if I want five fingers, I just walk it off five times. One, two, three, four, five. And this little extra area, that's five times my error. So I made five steps. So if I just extend it maybe a fifth of that, or roughly, probably the next time I walk it off, it'll be dead on perfectly. One, two, three, four, right on good guess. So at this point in time, just make an indentation. One, two, three, four, and then set this aside to use on your other boards. Oh, and I also forgot to put my baseline in. So the easiest way to do that is just grab yourself a little marking gauge or whatever you want, come over, set the depth, now, I told you earlier it wasn't that critical if you got this perfectly square because I'm going to set my marking gauge a little bit long so that the, the fingers will be a little bit proud and I can either sand or plane them back and that will make it perfectly square with the box at the end. And if I was smart, I would have done this before I put it in there, but I wasn't, so I would just mark it along the top and bottom. And I will lock this marking gauge and use the same marking gauge for the entire project. That basically created my baseline for my cuts. Next up, just mark out the lines, either using a knife or a pencil. I've explained in the past, I prefer a knife. Coming across the top. And then down the front. Next up, it's a simply a matter of sawing it out. So you pick up your saw. Once again, I'm using a cross cut saw in a rip situation. I want to remove these two middle sections. I've always found that on the long board, it's nice to have the solid pieces on the outside, whether it be dovetails or finger joints or whatever. You can have as many internal pieces as you want. I just like having a third one for this particular design. Come back over, and this is good practice to sawing on the waist side of the line, because it'll be a lot more important whenever you get to the next section. But the key thing I want you to notice is the tooth staying on this side. I am not going to allow it to come down very far at all. I can follow my line coming down, and when I hit my baseline here, all I gotta do is straighten it out and it should hit the baseline right on the back side without even looking. Once again, come over, put the saw in your line, 
nibble it to get it started, come back over, come straight down to the baseline, and then just ride it back up, focusing on staying on the waist side of the line. Do that with the other two, and you will be pretty much done with this sec this part of cutting a joint. It is not that complicated, not that time consuming. Now we've got to remove this two center sections, and that's where we can either use one of the funky saws, or can we, we can use one of the techniques we learned when we were cutting keys in the last section. If you remember, we cut a bunch of relief cuts practice just to break up the fibers. That is one way of removing the weights. Break up the fibers and then just chop it out with a chisel. It doesn't take long. To cut up all these fibers. But the way I typically would do it, whether I'm doing this joint or dovetails, is to grab a coping saw. Now the coping saw, I believe guys name for its original purpose, coping molding, for like, you know, crown molding and stuff like that, getting those two joints to come together so that it's, it looks nice. But really, it's just a, I don't, I want to say it's a bastardized version of a bow saw or maybe a jeweler saw. The problem is the frame of it. I don't think there's a good one out there unless you're wanting to spend a lot of money for them. Uh, they flex. They move so that you can't really hold the blade in tension. Now this is set up uh, traditionally in a push configuration and you could just flip the blade around and get in the pull configuration so it would maintain strength and straight line but you will still flex it. I mean this thing is really flexible. To me, this is just a rough cutting tool. I know some people will actually cut uh, inlays and stuff with that one, but for me, it's just rough cutting and I use it. Its only main purpose for me is cutting out the waste of joints like this right here. Now, a lot of people will teach you what you want to do is come up in and just get the saw moving back and forth and come down in a curve to a little bit above the baseline so that you can chop it out with a chisel. My thinking is that always leaves that curve right there and you'll have to come either come back in with it or do a lot more chopping. There's no reason why you can't go almost straight down to that baseline and make a coping saw turn 90 degrees. Now this is very abusive to the saw and you're going to bust blades when you do it this way. But blades are only like $5 for a dozen so it's not that big a deal to me. The idea is this. You have your board. Your carcass saw makes a curve coming down to the baseline. And you want to saw the waist over here. Well, the coping saw is a really aggressive blade. It has a huge amount of set coming on either side. So if you were to bring that blade all the way down here and use just one side of the tooth you could basically turn it around at that angle and then call it saw straight across. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to drop the saw down to the baseline. I'm going to lift it up just ever so slightly. And then the idea is to press it this way. And you can see the tension in the blade as it flexes. And then I'm just going to get the saw blade moving. Get it moving back and forth. And as long as that saw is moving, it will not bind up. And if I keep that pressure sideways and just slowly rotate it, one side of the tooth creates a triangle. And the whole secret with the coping saw is just, just keep it moving. As long as it's moving back and forth, it will not bind up. And you can do all kinds of curves with it if you want. But for me, this is its main purpose right here just to remove the waste in my joinery. From there, it's just a matter of chopping out the waste. And once again, this is an excellent use of your bench hooks. Uh, because you don't really care if you chop into them. And it positions your work sideways so that you can easily find vertical visually just by holding the chisel straight up and down. 
Remember, it's very hard to find vertical this way and that way. And as normal, I will follow the rule of halves. I'll go halfway down and halfway back to that baseline until I cannot go halfway back to the baseline. It just falls into that knife line. Because we're working in pine, you really do have to have a sharp edge. So this might be a good time to go ahead and do a little stroping to get that blade as sharp as possible. Half dozen strokes with a little bit of rouge. Half dozen strokes on the straight. Remove the burr. Set it aside. Get back to work. Now, if you don't have a coping saw and you did the just sever the fibers technique, I want you to show you how well that actually works. Because those fibers are all broken up, they just pop right out. And it doesn't take that hard a hit to get them going flying. So just come up close to the baseline. Don't go right to the baseline. And then, just like the coping saw side, work your way back to that baseline until you can't go far any split the difference anymore and it just falls into that knife line just give it nice smooth cuts down remove the waste on this side cut the other end of this one and the other long board and come back and we'll work on the short boards okay so we got our two long boards cut ready to go and we have our two short ones and all my lines are lining up the way they were originally so all the grain matches up now I think it's kind of important that if you had the ability to lay your boards out like this because it prevents things getting mixed up because now we're going to be transferring lines and that means that we are going to transfer this line to this line in this orientation not that orientation this orientation now it won't make a difference in this particular project but whenever you start doing dovetails and other kinds of joinery that will but to get this board mixed up with this side or this one will totally confuse everything and it probably won't go together. So if you have the ability to lay it out like this so that it will make transferring lines a lot simpler. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick these two boards up, come back over, flatten it out with the top, grab my other board, come back over, kind of line it up with the sides, line it up with the front, and transfer a straight line down. Now in this particular instance, I am going to use a pencil even though I normally use a knife. For the simple reason, it's easier for the camera to pick up. Come back in. The pencil line went in here. So it's actually marking part of the wood that's going to come up. So when I come up here, I've got to remove these sections right there. But once again, the pencil line has to come up. So when I saw these lines, I cannot remove the lead. The lead needs to stay. So this is one of those ones where I leave the line and cut on the waist side. So we raise the board up, get it somewhat straight. Drop our lines down to make sawing easier. And from here, it's just a repeat of what we did with the other one. Except you can also saw this line on the baseline instead of chopping it out. You only need to chop out the center one. Once again, you want to leave the lead as much as you possibly can. From there, just rotate the board, nothing changes, just saw on the waist side of the line, you're just using the line created with a marking gauge instead of a knife, that's the same thing. You got any schmutz, you can re remove it with your marking knife.
So time to remove the waste of this center section. Now, in case I wasn't clear, I don't like coping saws. I don't think they're very good tools. I use them, but they're not my favorite. One of my favorite tools, and it's also a turning tool, is a tool that I believe the coping saw was based on, the bow saw. Not only can you get a finer tooth, you can get a lesser set, you can get all different tiles of blades, but you can also put the blade in tension. Here it's saying, compare that to a coping saw. Thud. I mean, it doesn't even vibrate at all. It's so loose. This thing is really nice. Plus the fact it's got a longer blade on it, so you can get more action into it. Now, I believe these are more of a two-handed tool, and but just like a coping saw, just get it going, keep it going, and as long as you are moving, it's going to cut. And it is just so much easier to control than those coping saws. You can get a lot closer to the line, and if you are doing shapes and stuff like that, you'll have a lot more control because you can just put a lot more tension on the blade. Now, I've got this one set pretty loose, but even these spindly wooden legs, you can tension it so much that you can pop a blade just under its tension. So that you have a lot more flexibility if you can get yourself a nice bow saw or make one out of a kit like this one was done. Okay, let's see how we did. I've got all the boards lined up, the grain is lined up on the outside, so all it's left to do is try to assemble it. Come over here, drop this down. That one will work. On the outside, that one will work. Oops. Two and two. And that one wouldn't work and as you can see somewhat the grain lines up going all the way around so let's glue this one up set it aside and we'll come back to it after we do the top and bottom Okay, so here are the two, three 16 or so boards. I'm going to keep the best looking one for the top. So I'm going to set that aside. Now, when you're going to be joining two boards together, it makes sense at this point in time to make sure your grain is going in the same direction. That way, when you're planting the bottom smooth or something like that, it's horrible if you're planting half a board and then you come over and you get tear out on the other half. So you have to come back around this way and then you get tear out on this half. So you might as well get them going in the same direction so that you can plane all the way across the board at the same time. So I've got these two boards. You can see that the grain all lines up. So the grain is either going this way or that way. I don't really know, but it's probably going this way. So if I take this board and lay it right beside it, at least when I plane the tops and bottoms, the grain's going in the same direction. So I want to join these two ends right here. So I come over, I mark them on the top, and I'm going to pick them up so that these two sides are sitting right here. Put them in the clamp. Make sure that they are somewhat straight. 
somewhat flat. Get them as close as possible. Now, if you're going to be making a jointed edge, all you have to do is figure out how to get the degrees of these two boards to equal 180 degrees. Now, most of the time in the machinery world, we go to a jointer and get them both at 90 degrees so that when they match up, that board's coming together equal 180, so it's nice and flat. But with hand tools, we don't really care if they're perfect 90 degrees as long as they add up to that 180. So you can just come over and grab a plane and don't even worry about keeping it level. Just as long as you get a shaving all the way across on both boards, it's going to join up just fine. One more time. So I got a nice shaving coming across both boards full width. So if I were to take them out of the clamp, bring them back over, flip them up, they should equal a perfect 90 degrees. And I have a nice glue joint. And I sprung this one a little bit by having to uh, take a thick shaving so there's a little bit of an air gap in the middle so I can use one clamp to clamp across the top to squeeze it together and one clamp on either end to make sure they stay flat. It'll work out just fine. These are the kind of tips you'll get in chapter four when we start talking about hand flames. Okay, that's set aside and drying. So next step, we want to split this board in half using just the standard cheap saw we have right now. So real quickly, I'm just going to find the center. Now, if you're not in the dead center, really this isn't going to matter too much because they're going to be separated apart. People won't be able to tell that big a difference. But I'm just going to draw a line straight down the center, come over to my workbench, clamp it in. And remember if in the second section where I was talking about using one saw for another application, all you had to change was your body me mechanics. Well, I've got a cross-cut saw here. You've seen me use this today. There's no reason why I cannot use this to rip a board in half, just changing how I use it. So I'm going to come over here, put in my clamp, get it going, follow your line, Yeah, it moves that fast. Raise it up a little bit. <coughs> and keep going. Flip it over. Drop it down. And finish the cut from the other direction. I should not be able to do this. How could a crosscut saw possibly make a rip cut? But as you see, it does a good enough job. And now I have two boards. Granted, these edges are really rough, but just like before, I could sit them down in a hand plane and end up with two perfectly sized boards. So we just popped these out of the clamps and yes, these are a little bit proud as we planned. There are a few gaps here and there, but no big deal. And I got the top, I mean the bottom out of the clamps. It needs to be smoothed and planed out, same with the top. And in a second, we are going to chamfer these so that they will be inset inside this little uh, cave right here. But I'm going to take the liberty now to go ahead and sand all this flush, get this all looking nice, and we'll move on from there. So what we have right here is a glue joint. I mean, the glue is the only thing that is holding this together. There is no mechanical support on this one. And this was a very common joint you saw in uh, the Orient, uh, Japan, Asia, that kind of stuff. Uh, but the thing is, they didn't really use glue then. So how do they get stuff together? That's where we come into pegging a joint like this. 
if you were to drive a peg through this pin into the face right here and then another one through here in order for these to separate you would have to break the pin so that becomes a mechanical joint versus a glue joint so let's go ahead and peg this one so it will stay together no matter if the joint fa uh, glue fails now the first thing we need to do is make our pegs I have a 3 16 dowel here we have basically uh, 20 pegs that we need to do in this bo box so we need to first cut this up into 20 pieces that will at least go through the finger and a little ways into the wood now in order to do that I'm going to pull out one of my other favorite sawing jigs a little miter box and I have a video on how to make these they only take about five maybe ten minutes at the max to do and it's a good layout lesson so if you want to figure out how to make one of these go ahead and it allows you to cut angles repeatedly the most common being 90 degrees and what I like about it is once again it can turn any work surface into a workbench you have a little lip drop the piece of wood in there grab your saw and it will allow you to cut a very accurate angle and you build these specifically fit to a saw what's just so happened this one's built for that cross cutting saw that we've been using all day long so after you've prepped all your dowels the next step is going to be drilling the holes and we are going to be using a brad point bit which is really the only uh, kind of drill bit you need to be using in furniture making because it's a lot more accurate it'll allow you to center it but we just need a place for the brad to go into so I always find it easiest to use a scratch all to eyeball the center or lay it all out and start your hole with a scratch all you just seem to have a lot more control so I'm going to go around and just put a divot where I want to start the holes and that way the brad point on the drill bit will have a place to start now the thing about a good brad point bit besides a brad point it's got spurs on the side so if you want to get a good clean hole you want to go backwards first and allow those spurs to score themselves another trick with an egg beater if at all possible you want to get above the egg beater and use your forehead on the handle because that's what stabilizes everything so I'm going to line it all up make sure everything is okay and then use a little step ladder come on up put my forehead on the top of the handle now stabilize it go backwards until I score a hole and then just go down and the reason why I have that tape on the handle is because I can't really see the bit right now but as soon as I get to my depth that little flag is going to knock all the sawdust off and it'll tell me I've reached my final destination there we go nice simple straight hole after you draw all the holes it's simply a matter of putting a little glue on the tip and driving them down but right after we do that one before the glue has a chance to set or dry or even before I go to another side I want to flush cut them all out the reason why I want to do it at that point in time is because if there's any gap around the circle the sawdust created by whatever saw you're using to flush cut it will kind of mix with whatever glues on the outside and fill that kind of gap a little bit just a, just a little bit but every little bit counts so we are going to be using the second funky saw or I guess the third funky saw uh, the flush cutting saw what makes it so funky is it has no set the, there is the teeth are not bent to either side so if you ever cut something like a dovetail with a saw what's going to happen is you get about halfway into the cut it's probably going to start binding up and get hard to pull in and out because the wood will kind of form back against it and squeeze the blade it's not creating a big enough kerf for the blade to get through the other thing about them is they make them out of really flexible steel that's going to bounce back every time. This saw is designed to be bent. You come over, you put them down, and you, you bend them up to make your cut. Now because they have no set, you can do stuff like this without marring your work. However, I have found that American flush cutting saws, they basically cut the teeth all in one direction. So even though there's no official set to one side, it does raise up on one side. So I call those one-sided flush cutting saws because you can only kind of cut one direction. If you flip the blade over, you're going to start getting scratches. Uh, the Japanese style ones, they seem to be better about getting it flush on both sides. But having said that, you are still pressing metal against wood. There is a chance you will scratch it up. It's not that bad if it does. But because of that, if you are flush cutting, 
try to go with the grain. That way the scratches will be going with the grain. They'll be easier to hide and easier to fix the sand out. If you go across a grain, they score a little bit deeper for some reason. So, how do you use a flush cutting saw? Well, let me grab my glue out of my Ziploc bag, grab a peg, and grab my hammer. Put a little dab of glue on the end. Swirl it around to get the glue on the inside a little bit. And then drive it down. Use one hand to keep the saw plate flat against the work. Just get it moving. It doesn't take much pressure. Salt, flush cut, whatever you want. And if you're doing it right as a glue, if you spread your finger around, you'll drive a little bit of the sawdust into any gap. Now, if you're doing it this way, before you put your saw up, take a little water and wipe off any glue that might be in the teeth or cut a piece of dry wood to get all that glue out because it will harden in the teeth and make the saw not work very well. So, go ahead and do all the, all the uh, pegs and come on back and we'll start working on the top and bottom. So next up, we're going to saw out a rabbit out of our base. So it will slide up in here and won't give us as big a reveal. It'll be nice and flush so for a nice clean look. To do that, we first have to figure out how much of this we need to cut off. So the easiest way I know to do it is just take measurements directly off of the piece. So I am just going to line up one side on this side, bring my pencil, and this is going to be my cuts. And then to figure out how much I'm going to need to cut off to make the recess, the rabbits, I'm going to draw a pencil line all the way around on the interior. And because of wood movement, I'll have to cut off a little bit more than that. So there's our cut lines. And I will probably just rip this down really close and leave these in either sand or plane them back after it's all glued and uh, pegged onto the board. Okay, so now we're going to add this chamfer to it. Now, honestly, I normally do this with a, some kind of hand plane or something like that, but this is a sawing exercise, so we're going to learn how to do it. I have put a, a mark with my marking gauge about a third of the way all the way around this board. I tried to fill it in with lead so that you could see it on the board. And then we have the pencil line from the inside of the box. So to create this rabbit, what I want to do is say that this is my waist side, and I'm going to stay on this side of the line. So in that essence, I am going to take the line while I saw this, and it's going to stay on my trash wood. And then we are going to saw down from this type here to create the final rabbit. So we're going to make a saw cut down from the top and then across. Now here's a kicker. Remember when we talked about grain direction? Sawing this great distance is going to be kind of hard, especially with a, a carcass saw designed for cross cut. So we want to give ourselves the best chance of success and the easiest way to do that one is to create a path of least resistance. You've heard that term, me talk about that term before. So what I want to do is I want to cut the tenon out like that so this is cut out on this side so the saw will want to follow this path. I also want to cut it here. But if you notice if I stand above it and cut down I'm actually tearing out the wood. I'm, the wood's unsupported. So in this situation, it's best to get down on your knees and saw up. So this is what I'm talking about. I want to saw this board right here. I want to saw this corner off. So I'm going to come over to my line, and I'm going to start it down here, sawing only one line at a time. Then I'm going to look over on the top, and I'm going to saw this line over here. But because I'm going with the grain, it is a lot easier to actually do the saw cut and come down. I'll then do the same thing on this side. But if you notice on this side, if I go against the grain, all of a sudden I am fighting. It does not want to work well. It is better for me to come over here and go with the grain. And I got a little off my line. Reset it. Come down on this side. Work my way along that side. And then right it up. 
now I have a path for me to keep my saw on this side and a place to go on that side. So I actually start sawing about halfway from each direction. So we will meet in the middle. Now that we've met in the middle, I now have a kerf I can follow pretty much all the way across it. So I now no longer have to worry about aim. And all I need to worry about is keeping the saw moving. And it's going to take a while with such a saw, a small saw, but you'll get the work done. Once you've made those rip cuts, those long cuts, it's time to do the cross cutting. And I'm afraid this is too big for our bench hook, so the secret is to just use a clamp. I'm going to use my bench hooks just to hold it still while you saw it. Now, try to get as close to the edge as possible because when you bring your saw down, you don't want to get into your bench. And then it's just the same exact process we've been doing over and over and over. And if possible, focus on not going too far deep on either end so your cut won't show. Doesn't really matter if you go too far deep in the middle, you just don't want to be too far deep on the end. So I am nibbling my way across to establish a kerf. Following my line. And it doesn't really matter how accurate you are as long as you are on the good side of your waistline they'll still fit inside the box. And once you got a long curve established, relax your hand. Maybe add a little wax. Take long, smooth cuts. It won't take long. Now for the long side, there is an easier way. Just look at the grain direction, see which way it's going. Remember, it always comes down the grain. Take your chisel to the base and just give it a whack. If you're concerned about the finish of the broken off piece, you can always just clean it up with your chisel. The bottom of your saw curve will give you a nice straight line to follow. Just ride that bevel until you get the finish you like. So let's see how it's going to fit. Pretty nice. Flush on this side, little overhang here. Flush on this side, little overhang here, just as we planned. So real quick, I'm going to run a bead of glue down one side. And because we've got to allow for a little bit of expansion and contraction, because this is not this this grain is going against each other. I'm not going to put glue on this side, but I am going to peg it all the way around, just like we did here. Except I'm going to drive the pegs in kind of at an angle, so it'll be somewhat dovetailed, and it'll lock it all together. For the top, just do the same thing. Run a bead glue along the long grain, up and down, but I wouldn't put any glue across here, because once again, you're looking at cross grain uh, matchup. Uh, just drop some dowels in there, and if you want to dovetail these, you can too. Also, if you want to practice more on that rabbiting skill, feel free to rabbit the tops. I didn't. I also took the liberty of going ahead and sanding everything flush, so it's already rock and roll. So hopefully, you did your homework from the uh, second section, tuned up all your keys, and put holes in the nodes. So from here, we're, all we got to do is attach them. And the idea is to just spread it out. I've cut out a bunch of little squares out of some excess leather but you can use some thick cloth or anything like that just to get the keys off the wood so that they will be free to vibrate a little bit and then just position them mark the holes drive in some nails and drop the keys on top of the nails and the holes that i drilled are going to allow the keys to just bounce around on these nails 
So I do that one and come on back and we will have a musical instrument. That's all this gorilla knows how to play. Hey, making the musical instrument wasn't the real goal of this exercise. We were learning different techniques, and today we got to explore a lot more with a back saw, a lot more advanced cuts that, so that you can use in joinery. Cutting these rabbits on the side would be the same technique you would use for cutting breadboard ends or tenons for the breadboard ends. You got to learn about cr cross cutting, ripping, all that kind of stuff. Plus, we got to play around with some of the more funky tools, like the coping saw, the bow saw, and that flush cutting saw. Different techniques for using them to get the best results. And we got to learn about a little bit about waves, frequency, vibration, and this being a resonator box, supposedly the theory is the sound waves go in there, they bounce around, and because you have a small hole coming out, as they bounce around, they kind of amplify themselves. They come into sync, and the sound coming out of that is a combination of a whole bunch of waves, not just the one wave coming off the board. That's how guitars work in anyways. Well, I hope you enjoyed this project, learned a little bit, advanced your skill level some so you feel comfortable in sawing the line, taking the line, or leaving the line, and splitting the line, and that you'll be able to build a lot more stuff in the future. And at the end of this, I want you to remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe, have fun, and please like, favorite, subscribe, tell your friends, all that kind of social media stuff. And one last note, all those little asterisks you saw up in the corner, we do have some products for sale on our website, wortheffort.com, that will help fund future videos and other stuff like this. The next one in this series is all about maintaining and modifying your saws to get the best results. Y'all be safe and have fun.